Uh, so good afternoon, everybody, and um, here's welcome to your second class in microbiology. Um, uh, this is uh, towards the end of our last class when I talked to you about Robert Koch, and um, I'll just remind you these two very, very, very important names, Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, whose work ushered in the golden age of microbiology in the 19th century. Now, Pasteur did something very important, which was to demonstrate for the very first time in his work on wine fermentation, that a microorganism, a yeast, could actually perform a specific function. So this was the first time that a microorganism was shown to do something, um, in that case, something useful. Uh, but it opened up the possibility that microorganisms might also do things which were not useful, which were actually dangerous, and that they might cause disease. This was known as the germ theory of disease, and it met with huge opposition. Um, many, many of the early biologists opposed this idea. Again, the old story of spontaneous generation raised its head. They said, no, that these pro the processes that took place took place because life was generated spontaneously. But uh, there were many early microbiologists, Pasteur and Koch amongst them, who firmly believed that microorganisms could in fact cause disease and that a specific microorganism w might cause a specific disease. To our ears, this is obvious, but you must realize that science is a, is a process of building knowledge upon knowledge upon knowledge. And this was not clear and obvious to, to early workers. And it was the work of Robert Koch in Germany, which finally demonstrated positively that a particular or microorganism could cause a specific disease. And in this case, the disease he worked on was anthrax, so a very dangerous disease, very dangerous for, for human beings. Um, but uh, it's uh, also extremely important in, in agriculture, and it used to cause huge losses of livestock. Um, and he worked on anthrax, and he was able to demonstrate that this particular microorganism here, which whose name is Bacillus anthracis, literally translated the anthrax bacillus, he was able to prove that this microorganism caused the specific symptoms and disease of anthrax. And he did it as follows. I'm uh, repeating this because this is tremendously important. It's really important that you that you understand these what are referred to as Koch's postulates because they still apply. We still apply wherever we can. We apply Koch's postulates to prove that a particular organism causes a particular disease. So what his postulates were, this is the way he worked through them. Um, he saw the same bacillus in every case of the disease that he examined. He saw the same bacillus appear. That's a good clue that it might be causing disease. That's not definitive proof though, that it's causing the disease. There's just an association. So he extracted the bacteria and grew them in pure culture. Um, this is the second possible. You have to be able to grow the organism in pure culture, no other, there's nothing else except that organism. When you take that organism from pure culture and you inject it into an experimental animal, the animal acquire, must acquire the disease and it must acquire the symptoms of the disease and that you, that you originally observed. And finally, and probably one of the most important of all of the postulates, you must be able when you look at your experimental animal, you must be able to extract exactly the same microorganism as you started out with. In other words, you've passaged the microorganism through this, these postulates, and you must be able to recover it at the end. 
those are cox posts. Sometimes in human disease, it's not possible to prove cox postulates experimentally. And I'll give you a good example. That is, and that's the example of AIDS, of HIV infection leading to the disease of AIDS. Um, cox postulates could not be applied there for a very important reason. This is quite common in human disease. We have no animal model. We have no animal model which will reproduce the symptoms of AIDS for us to then recover the. So you will commonly hear um, people um, of particular ideological bent informing you that it's never been proved that HIV causes human immunodeficiency virus causes AIDS because you haven't they haven't gone through Cox postulates with the with the organism. That is actually, in, in, formally that's true because you can't run those experiments, but unfortunately, human beings have run that experiment. And the way in which we've, we've run the experiment through cost positives is if you look at populations such as people who use intravenous drugs and acquire the disease and pass it from one person to another, it's very easy to demonstrate in actual fact that cost postulates do apply. So. Um, uh, immediately that there, uh, there was this realization that microorganisms can cause disease, that they can cause, that, that was dubbed infectious disease. Um, and this was a, a radically new idea. But the idea that, that people became, could infect one another with disease was a very, very, very old one because human beings had been through any number of uh, disease plagues such as the, 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 the disease plague or black plague, that's one of them. But the other one, other disease that people from ancient times have been absolutely terrified of is smallpox. And for very good reasons, smallpox is extremely contagious, very easily spread. Um, it, smallpox, the, the, it's a viral disease. It causes these terrible sores called pox and that, this is the actual pox um, and the, it, it's, it has a high mortality rate um, but if you do survive it can also leave you hideously hideously disfigured so people were really terrified of smallpox and from very ancient times uh, they uh, human being different human populations have made use of a system of inoculation to prevent smallpox. This is the way it worked. It's been recorded in at least two um, uh, particular civilizations in China and um, in the Middle East, in Arab, uh, it was Arab doctors who did this regularly. But there's also now indications that it might have been done in Africa as well. And what people observed was that if you if you broke open one of these sores from somebody who was busy recovering from the disease, so somebody who was at the tail end of the illness, you broke open this, these sores and you used that liquid to inoculate somebody who had not yet had the disease. They would get the disease, they would get smallpox, but they would hope, in most cases, they would get a mild form of the disease. And they, it had been observed since very, very early on that once you've had smallpox, even if you have it as a very small child, you never get smallpox again. In other words, people who have had the virus are immune to subsequent exposure. And um, these systems of inoculation were very dangerous because sometimes, if this was live smallpox virus, it was weakened, it had been weakened by the person's immune system, by immune attack on the virus. So that towards the end of the illness in people who are busy recovering, they had weakened virus, which you could use to do the inoculation and hopefully the number of people who uh, were successfully inoculated with the, the, this 
system was higher than the number who would die from smallpox during a plague. So it was advantageous to actually be brave enough to do it. There was a risk that you could that you could in fact become extremely ill, but for the most part they they were quite it was successful. Um, the system was um, imported to Britain by uh, the um, by the wife of the British ambassador to Istanbul, uh, then known as Constantinople, and he, he um, she rather um, had her own. They were in Constantinople when and there was an outbreak of smallpox, and she had her children inoculated and herself successfully. And when they returned to, to Britain, there was an out, the, the, this epidemic had spread to Britain and they were completely spared. And she encouraged people to do this inoculation. Um, but it still carried a heavy risk. But in 1796, this gentleman, Edward Jenner, formulated a system whereby you could be inoculated with a harmless virus. He made the observation that women who milked cows very frequently acquired a very, very mild illness. It all that they could happen. The cows had a pox disease of their own called cowpox. And the milkmaids would have a mild disease where they got blisters on their hands, where they'd been handsing the other. And the observation had been made since time immemorial that, that milkmaids do not get smallpox. He was very interested. He wasn't the only one. There were other people who were on the same track. But he, was, he is credited with having developed the system and formal, formalizing it. He would go, go when he ever heard about an outbreak of cowpox, he would go and he would get, he would take liquid from the, the sores on the milkmaid's hands and he would dry it and preserve it. Um, and that was perfectly good enough. He, that would keep the virus. And he would then use a needle and make a scratch on people's arms, wherever, and rub some of this crystalline serum with the virus into it. And people would develop a very, very mild illness. Usually, they, do, they wouldn't even notice, and they would be immune. Because that this, although this virus is not smallpox virus, it is similar enough in structure to smallpox virus that our immune system treats it exactly as if it was smallpox. So you acquire immunological memory. It sees the cowpox virus, it acquires immunological memory. If ever it sees the real smallpox, it reacts really strongly against it and it knocks it out before you can fall ill. And that protection is immunity. Jenner's system of, of inoculation was called vaccination. And that comes from this part of the word. That part of the word comes from Latin, vaca, for cow. That's why we call it vaccination. It's a memory of the fact that the first true vaccination used cowpox. Now, um, we can go back to France, because in France, Louis Pasteur was very, very interested in vaccination. And he developed all sorts of systems of vaccination. He used another system. He didn't. For example, he developed a, a vaccine against rabies. Rabies is a terrible, terrible viral disease. Um, and once you begin to show symptoms, um, it is almost invariably fatal. It's got about 100% fatality rate if you show symptoms. Um, people were terrified of rabies. It was very common in Europe. And um, Pasteur developed a, a vaccination system. And what he did was he took um, virulent rabies from an animal that had, was suffering and dying of rabies, took that, and he would inject it into rabbits. And then 
um, he would leave it to, to, for the rabbit to develop symptoms, they said, and then he would take blood from the rabbit and he'd pa pass it on. He'd actually take brain matter as well. And he would inject another rabbit, then he'd inject another rabbit, then he'd inject another rabbit, then another rabbit, then another, another. He'd carry on and on and on, injecting, serially injecting rabbits with the virus until he ended up with a rabbit that actually survived. And he would, he, he then took that rabbit's serum, which is now full of antibody to the, to the, the virus and has weakened the virus. He would take that, that, that virus, weakened by all the antibody, and he would use that to vaccinate. And he could successfully vaccinate. The advantage of vaccination in rabies is rabies, although it's so virulent, it, it incubates very, very, very slowly. So if you are bitten by a rabid animal, you can be vaccinated and your immune system will react far more rapidly than the virulent virus can grow. So it was both a vaccination and a cure. And he had some spectacular, very, very famous cases where he was able to cure people who had been uh, bitten by rabid animals, which up until then was a death sentence. He developed um, all sorts of vaccines. He also developed another um, vaccine, not a very good one, but a vaccine nonetheless for cholera, which did give some protection, especially during um, pandemic, um, epidemics, outbreaks of cholera, um, and, the, and various other diseases as well. So at the same time as they're proving germ theory, uh, germ theory, these systems of vaccination are beginning to be applied, and they are the f mankind's first real inroad into controlling infectious disease and a very important step. Okay, so um, leaving aside our little bit of history, um, the next major step um, in, uh, in microbiology was the development of antibiotics and, and things like that in the 20th century. And we will talk about that again a little bit later when we talk about antibiotics. Okay. Let's have a look and see um, what sorts of um, uh, organisms we're going to consider uh, when we talk about the microbial world. Um, and so the very first thing, uh, this may be a repetition for some of you, but uh, this is extremely important for us to recognize that we, when we look at living things on the planet, first of all, they're all cellular based. Um, all cells arise from another cell. But uh, there are two kinds of cell that we recognize. The first is the one is one which we're going to spend most of our time talking about in this microbiology class. And these are the prokaryotes. That is the word prokaryote means early cell. And um, these are generally small, um, usually less than five microns long, around about there. Um, and they are characterized by having only a cell membrane. They only have a cell membrane. On the inside of that cell membrane, there is a cytoplasm. And um, inside the cytoplasm, all living things have ribosomes. So the prokaryotes have ribosomes as well. And their genetic material, the DNA, is inside the cytoplasm. You will often see it referred to as being loose inside the cytoplasm. I don't like to use that word because it implies that it's somehow chaotic. It is not. The DNA is very, very carefully organized. It's often organized in microbes into a specific dense area, which we call the nucleoid. Not the nucleus, but the nucleoid. Um, and, and in some microbes, it is actually visible um, inside the cytoplasm. Um, there may be other small pieces of DNA, as we'll hear later on, called the plasmids um, in ribosomes, but no other org there's no organelles. An organelle is an inclusion in the cytoplasm which has its own membrane around it. There are none in the prokaryotes. 
Now, there are two prokaryotic groups. The first we are going to talk about extensively, those are the bacteria. But there's another group. They are called the archaea, an extremely interesting group, but we are not going to discuss them, except to refer briefly to them now and again. Um, they, they, they're no disease-causing archaea uh, that we know of. Um, but uh, of course, the bacteria will form the major emphasis in our studies. Again, the prokaryotes have only a cell membrane. Here's something to remember. We'll talk about it again in a minute. But the, most bacteria have around them a cell wall that is totally different to the cell membrane. It's a totally different entity. And you'll hear about more about it later on. So cell membrane only, no organelles. The other kinds of cells in the, the biosphere um, are the eukaryote cells. These are the true truly cellular cells. That's what eukaryote means. And the eukaryote cells not only have a cell membrane, they also have organelles included in the cytoplasm, each of which has its own membrane around it. The most prominent of all is the nucleus. That is the easiest scene. And often you will hear, you will hear uh, uh, people define eukaryotes as those cells which have a nucleus. Well, that's not really a good definition. The true definition of a eukaryote cell is that it has, it, it has organelles which are membrane bound because the nucleus is actually just another organelle. It's just that it's usually the most prominent. It's the thing you can see the easiest inside the cell. And it is very large, very easily seen. And here it is here. You can see its membrane around. Actually, the nucleus has a double membrane around it. <clears throat> and these are all other organelles, that each with their own membranes around them. And then on the outside, the cell membrane. So the membrane that surrounds these organelles is basically the same plan as the cell membrane. And we refer to it as being a plasma membrane. So the cell membrane is a plasma membrane. It's the plasma membrane that defines the outside of the cell. But all of the organelles, they have their own plasma membrane, which binds them. And I repeat the importance of these membranes. I have mentioned it before, but the importance of the membrane is that it allows the one side to be different to the other. It allows the cytoplasm, for example, to be different to the medium that the cell is suspended in. The inside is different to the outside because the cell membrane regulates what passes back and forth. Same thing for the organelles. The organelle membranes allow the inside of the organelle to be different to the outside and it allows function to be specialized inside the membrane. That's what, that is the importance in terms of the organelles. Eukaryote cells are usually much larger, much, much larger than um, prokaryote cells. And um, I'll just mention that there are two kinds of eukaryote cell. There's an animal cell and plant cells, and there are some differences between them. Um, so let's have a look at what kinds of, of microorganisms we're going to be talking about. Um, first of all, bacteria will be our main focus in, in this class. Uh, the prokaryotes, um, the archaea, they are the other prokaryote group, but we're not going to talk about them a lot. The fungi are somewhat uh, different. The fungi are eukaryotes. Um, they have uh, one thing about them, they have a cell wall, but the cell wall contains a substance called chitin. They're the only um, kind, of, they're the kind of microbial group that will ever have chitin around it. We, we include them in, although many of the fungi are large, we include them in our studies of, of microbiology because they are fungal groups which are unicellular, and those we refer to as the yeasts. So the, the, the yeasts are, are disease, often disease-causing organisms, but don't forget, the yeasts are also very useful. For example, bread yeast, brewer's yeast, all those things are yeasts, 
they are fungi. The fungi all have one characteristic that they do share with bacteria, and that is they cannot eat. They cannot take stuff into their cells. Okay, so instead what they have to do is they have to release enzymes into their environment, break down material in their environment into, into compounds which are simple enough that they can be moved across the cell membrane by diffusion. So uh, fungi are exactly the same. They release, they cannot eat, they release enzymes into the environment, break stuff down around the cells, and that moves into the cell by diffusion, same as bacteria. But many of the fungi are multicellular and, uh, and can, be, can be really large. Um, the other group uh, we will talk about are the protozoa. We'll only do very briefly when we talk about uh, a little bit about um, eukaryotes that cause disease in human beings. This is not a disease-causing protozoan. This is Volvox, which is a free-living photosynthetic protozoan. And I'll just mention these uh, go into that group called the protists. We have, we have the groups of the, the plants, the animals, um, the fungi, and the protists. Those are the four eukaryotic groups. Um, we will not talk, uh, algae are also microorganisms. Here's one here, the Volvox. We are not going to talk about them. Um, but they are also protists. They are not plants, despite the fact that they're autotrophic and often very often green, not always, but it's often green. They are protists, they are not plants. We will talk very uh, briefly, uh, I hope, about multicellular animal parasites. Um, they, the multicellular animal parasites, we include them in micro studies of microbiology because often they are very small. Um, but um, we're not, we won't talk about them extensively. But what we will talk about a lot are the viruses. Now, viruses are not really microorganisms. And the reason I say that is because viruses are not living. There is nothing about them which classifies their existence as life. They have no metabolism. They do have nucleic acid, but the, often the nucleic acid is RNA, it's not DNA. We gave it the characteristic of life. A characteristic of life is that all living things have DNA. But the viruses often have RNA. For in COVID-19, it's an RNA virus. Influenza, it's an RNA virus, it doesn't have DNA. There's no cell in viruses. Um, there's no cellular structure. And so we don't, viruses are very, very complicated biochemicals. They're a very complicated collection of biomolecules that perform certain functions for certain things, there's certain features which do distinguish them. We will certainly be talking about them in some detail um, later on. So here are bacteria. Again, these are prokaryotes simply means before early cell, before a nucleus. Um, they are single celled, but often they, um, as they, they, they reproduce by division, by cell division. And um, often when they do so, they will stick together. And those, the way in which they sit together is often characteristic. It's like one of the characteristics you look for. Um, here you can see them in, in, in um, uh, here in chains, in long chains. And this, these here, by the way, uh, are not disease-causing bacteria. Uh, these here are um, photosynthetic bacteria. They're called the cyanobacteria, very important in nature. Uh, but these are bacilli. The, this is bacillus of some sort. Um, they all divide by binary fission. And again, I remind you, they derive their nutrition by releasing enzymes. They break down organic matter and absorb it in simpler forms, which can pass across the cell membrane. Some uh, bacteria, as here, are able to photosynthesize, and it is in the bacteria, actually, that the whole system of photosynthesis, taking light, sunlight, and using it to put carbon dioxide and water together into complex molecules, it is in the 
bacteria that that system evolved in cyanobacteria. Archaea, um, I'm only going to mention them in passing. Very interesting, they are prokaryotes. Um, they, there's some differences between their cell walls. Uh, the U bacteria, the, the true bacteria, all have a, have a compound called peptidoglycan in their cell wall, and you'll see it in a minute, again in a minute. But the archaea do not have peptidoglycan. They have different, and they are, they, their ribosomes are different, and they're all sorts of things which distinguish them from the bacteria. One of the f interesting things about them, they're often in extremely harsh environments. So they will, if, for example, you'll get, find them in hot springs. You'll find them in um, very, very salty water. Um, all of the, any harsh, really harsh um, environment, uh, the, the archaea are actually often able to survive where everything else is, is dead. That's about all I'm ever going to say about the archaea. Here are some fungi that are familiar to you. Um, these are, this is just bread mold. And um, again, the, the fungi are eukaryotes. Um, they have a they have organelles inside their cytoplasm and often a very big nucleus, which is easy to, easy to see. They have chitin in their cell walls. Um, the, the only other group that actually you produces chitin are the animals. Uh, so for example, you know, insects have chitin in their exoskeleton, but here in the fungi, they, they have chitin in the cell wall. They absorb their nutrients in exactly the same way as bacteria, releasing enzymes into the environment. Many are multicellular, but the yeasts are unicellular. And um, they, we pay some considerable attention to the fungi because they are a major source of antibiotics. Um, and they release antibiotics into the environment to improve their chances of being the only ones around. They realize that they, if they're absorbing their food, for example, in exactly the same way as bacteria do, bacteria in the environment are competitive. So many of the, many microorganisms release antibiotics as a way of squelching their competition and being able to use more food, have more food available to them. Now, the protozoa, the, the vast majority of protozoa are free living, not disease causing. And we're not going to talk about it. the protozoa are eukaryotes, but they are put into their own eukaryote group called the protists. And the, um, they have many different lifestyles, many different, there are many different morphologies to um, the protists. The protozoa are those protists which are single celled. And the only ones that we are going to pay any attention to at all are those which cause disease. And here is a, a good example. This is a little organism. You can see one here the, called Trypanosoma. And Trypanosoma is a protozoan um, which causes sleeping sickness. And it's transmitted by the bites of flies. Um, and uh, there are also trypanosomes, which are transmitted by the bites of bed bugs. So uh, here it is here, and we will refer to them much later on in the semester. We will briefly talk about disease caused by protozoa. The algae, again, this is again, Volvox. We're not gonna talk about them because they, with their, no, there's, one or two obscure disease-causing algae, uh, but the, it's so rare that it's not going to form part of our discussion. But nonetheless, it's, it, we should pay, just acknowledge the algae for one thing, and that is the vast majority of our oxygen in the atmosphere is actually generated by algae not generated by, a lot is generated by plants, by multicellular photosynthesizers like the plants, but a, a, a lot of the oxygen in our atmosphere, about 60% is produced actually by algae 
by marine algae in particular, and also by marine bacteria, which can photosynthesize because oxygen is a byproduct of photosynthesis. That's where our oxygen comes from. Okay, so um, here's some definitions of viruses for you. Uh, viruses are acellular. They have no cell structure. There is a viral unit, which is called a viroid. Um, and the, the, it contains a, a core. It's a DNA or RNA uh, strand, sometimes in duplicate, um, sometimes in multiples. The viruses are incredibly diverse. And uh, some of them are RNA, some of them DNA um, as their hereditary material. And that core the, which of nucleic acid is always surrounded by a protein coat. Sometimes that's all they have is that protein coat around it. But often that protein coat has another coat around it. And um, that is a lipid envelope. And um, COVID-19 is one which has a, a lipid envelope just like that. So does influenza. But then on the inside, they have a protein coat as well, containing the hereditary material. Viruses are utterly unable to reproduce on their own. They have no metabolism of their own. And what they are, in actual fact, is a group of predatory genes. Of, and those genes are seeking a host. They have to acquire a host in order for the virus to be reproduced. And once, the, once that happens, once a cell is infected with a virus, the viral genome takes over the functioning of the cell and forces the cell to produce more viral particles. Outside of the viral host, when the viral particles are produced and released, they're completely inert. They have no metabolism at all. Um, so that, that is the basic function of viruses. But we will re definitely return to the viruses because they're so important, incredibly important in human disease process. Multicellular animal parasites, we do include them in microbiology because often, often uh, they are extremely small and do. But it's, um, we will not talk much about these at all. Um, often uh, parasites do have microscopic stages in their life cycles, even if they are very large. But even if the adults are large, they may have microscopic early stages. That's why they are included in the study of microbiology. So you'll realize that um, the world around us, there's an incredible diversity of living organisms. There are many, many, many thousands of different kinds of bacteria, for example, many of which have never been worked on or never been isolated or described, but we know that they are there. If we look at the collections of DNA from the environment, we can see that there are just thousands upon thousands of different kinds of bacteria. And then there are thousands of kinds of eukaryotes as well. Um, it's very difficult to try and sort out a way of putting all of this into order in a way where we can show how one thing is related to another. And uh, for uh, right up until um, the mid 1700s, the way in which biologists, early biologists did it was each animal, plant, whatever, would have a description in Latin, a whole lengthy description. Okay, so this is a flower which grows in My cat just knocked something off. I jumped about that high in the air. Um, the, um, I just totally lost my place now. Um, yes, so the early biologists, they would write out this whole description. This, this grows in such and such a place, in such a, and I found it in such a, and it's a blue flower with so many petals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Very difficult to easily place that organism that they were describing in relationship to another organism. Until this gentleman, you'll see various names from Carolus Linnaeus is his Latin name. Um, his, he was actually a Swede and his name was Carl Linné. But uh, in it's Carolus Linnaeus, 
that is the, his Latin name. And he developed the system of nomenclature. He collected organisms of all different kinds from all over the world. He had a huge natural history collection and he decided to, make, to actually put this into some sort of order. And he began to relate things to one another. So if he saw, if he got oh, um, organisms which were very distinct and you could see that they, they formed it, that they were all very, very, very similar to one another, he would name them the same thing. Um, and they would have a unique name. Now he, his brilliance was that he gave a, a dual name. Uh, it's a genus, is the first, and then the second is the specific epithet. So for example, we in bacteria, in bacteriology, we will often hear about things like Staphylococcus aureus. Each of those names is somehow descriptive. We'll point, I'll point out that there are many Staphylococci. So there's many members of the genus Staphylococcus, but all of those which share a particular set of characteristics are named aureus. So as soon as I say Staphylococcus aureus, I can picture in my mind exactly what I'm dealing with. Not only that, by calling it Staphylococcus aureus, I realize that it is related to all the other Staphylococci, that they share characteristics, okay? And so the, the, when you look at this, the scientific names, that's the scientific name, genus and species, the scientific names, are always italicized or they are underlined. They're italicized if you can possibly do it. If you're typing out on your computer, whatever, you always put the genus and species into italics. If you don't do that, they are always underlined because that's an indication to a printer. When a printer sees the name underlined, he'll put it into italics. Um, the genus is always capitalized. So Staphylococcus aureus would have a capital S and the specific name has a, has a lowercase. Staphylococcus, capital S, aureus, lowercase a. Um, they would often give a specific name. Um, they would often choose a name um, to honor somebody. Maybe if somebody found something, if you find a new species, sometimes they will they will name it after you. That has fallen very much out of favor in modern times. Instead, we opt now for making the name useful. In other words, describing a characteristic is much more acceptable. You can still do it, you can name it whatever you like, but um, it, it, the name has to be absolutely unique. If you're naming a new species, the name has to be, com the specific name has to be completely unique. You can't share a specific name with something else in the same genus. So, for example, um, Escherichia coli, which you'll hear about again and again and again and again, is named after Thomas Escherich, and he was the person who discovered and described it. Coli is more useful because that describes where the bacterium lives. It lives in the intestine, in the colon. So uh, that tells you something useful about this bacterium. Escherichia, capital E. Coli, lowercase, and the whole name is italicized. Now, you may take, we may take a large number of different genera and realize that they all fit together, that they share characteristics. Those, we, would, we put that higher grouping goes into a family. And um, then we can take families that share characteristics, we can move it up. And what is happening is we are placing organisms in order which reflects their relationships. Okay, so um, members of the genus um, that have this, has different species, we, we can make an assumption that all of those organisms share a, a relatively recent common ancestor. If we group all of, a whole lot of different genera together which share a characteristic in a family, they also share an ancestor, but more remote. 
So our system of taxonomy, of naming organisms, also can impart to us a lot of useful information about other relationships that the organisms have, and also about their, something about their evolution as well. This is a little bit more obscure and a little bit more difficult in bacteriology, but in higher organisms, it is very clear that these ascending levels of taxon taxonomy um, reflect actual relationships in evolutionary time. Here are some common ones. Just for you to hear, if we were doing a live class, I would be regularly giving you spelling tests so that you learn these. Uh, but uh, the, the responsibility is on you to start acquiring these names so that they become familiar to you. Um, if you're going to leave this microbiology class, you want a whole suite of these common uh, genera and species clear in your heads and know how to say them. The Salmonella enterica. Um, Salmonella enterica is um, an organism which you probably you may have heard of. Um, uh, there are many kinds of Salmonella enterica. They have different strains and that cause different gut diseases. Um, then this is the classic Salmonella. This is what you get Salmonella poisoning from. Salmonella enterica. Obviously enterica part because of it's in the intestines. Um, it's named actually, it doesn't have anything to do with the fish, salmon. It's named for somebody called salmon. Um, but the enterica part tells you where it lives. Streptococcus pyogenes. Now this name, both the genus and the species are useful. They give you information about this organism. Streptococcus means occurring in straight chains. Streptococcus is in straight chains. And the streptococcus pyogenes, pyogenes, because streptococcus pyogenes, an infection in the skin will often produce pus. And uh, it, you can actually have it internally, very, very dangerous, um, but it generates, it causes a, a, a vigorous reaction from your immune system and you produce pus in response to it. Um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that's one you must remember, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is a fungus, it's a yeast, it's a single cell, and this is our, our most useful yeast. Um, this is Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae, is used in ma manufacture of alcohol, wine, beer, etc. But it's also used to make bread. So that's also the brewer's yeast. Is another. There are various strains of the of the fungus which are used for different things. So uh, Saccharomyces. It means it. This is a fungus. The myces part is fungus. Saccharo sugar, sugar using fungus. And cerevisiae actually means makes beer because that's where it was first isolated, where it was from beer. Um, penicillium chrysogenum. Um, Christ, okay, penicillium, um, you will see later on that um, penicillin is a fungus. This is the fungus that we get the drug penicillin from, but it has a it produces a little tuft like a paintbrush when it reproduces, of the produce spores. And that's what this penicillin part refers to. It refers to this little paintbrush, that's in Latin, the paintbrush. And um, chrysogenum means yellow. Um, and it, it releases a yellow pigment into the medium. So that's where the, the last one, just on this short list, trypanosoma. Cruzi. Trypanosoma, um, that is, we saw it earlier. Where were we? There, here it is here. Um, each, each of these is a trypanosome. And um, trypanosoma means corkscrewed. Um, uh, and that's a, when you look at it under the microscope, you very distinctly see um, a membrane that undulates down the side of the organism that looks like a corkscrew. Cruzi is a name. It was uh, named after a, 
a South American uh, biologist, Oswaldo Cruz. And um, this uh, Trypanosoma cruzi causes a disease called Chagas disease, an, an infectious parasitic disease which is transmitted by bed bugs. So learn these names. You're going to learn lots more, but start now getting used to learning them, how to spell them, and how to pronounce them. Um, here are a couple more. Um, but these are these are ones um, which you will hear about again. Um, I've already mentioned Staphylococcus aureus. Remember what we, we, our list that we just did? We just did Streptococcus. Streptococcus means straight chain, and that's exactly what they look like. When you look at them under the microscope, you'll see them. First of all, strepto, straight coccus, spherical. So Streptococcus spherical cells in a straight line. Staphylococcus, this refers to the fact that these are clustered. It looks, and the name Staphylopod uh, comes from Latin for grapes, and they look like a bunch of grapes, not in a straight chain, but in a bunch. So that's cocky, spherical cells in a bunch, which are yellow. Aureus is yellow. The cells themselves, the colonies, when you look at them on solid media, they have. Uh, they often have a yellow color. Depends what medium you grow them on, but the medium that they were growing it on initially, it had a bright yellow color. That's clear. But now here we have two um, organisms which are in the same genus, but are different species. So here we have Nyseria. That is how it's pronounced, Nyseria. Meningitides. And the, menin the specific names here are very important because they describe the disease that these organisms cause. So Nyseria is a, also a coccus. What normally, 99% of the time, when you look at cocci, they have a particular uh, reaction when you stain them. They have a, a positive gram stain. You'll hear about this in a minute again. Uh, Nyaseria are one of the rare cocci, which are gram negative. They occur as a diplococcus. Um, when you look at these two species, they look very, very similar, but they cause two completely different diseases. Meningitis causes a very virulent meningitis um, and uh, with a very high mortality rate. Nyaseria gonorrhea looks very, very similar under the microscope but it causes a sexually transmitted disease, and that is, of course, gonorrhea. It gets, it gets its name from that. Same genus, look the same, but they do two radically different things. Um, it's a convention that um, when you are writing, like if you're writing an essay or something about bacteria, the first time you mention the organism, you write the name out in full. So this is an example. Escherichia coli and Staphylococcus aureus are found in the human body. That's your first statement. Your second statement, you can abbreviate. You can abbreviate just the genus to E here. E. coli is found in the large intestine and S. aureus is found on skin. So first mention, full name. Subsequent mentions, you can abbreviate the genus. You will see E. coli is so commonly talked about that um, you will often see it, you'll seldom see it written out, but it should be. Properly, it should be written out in full the first time that, the first time that you, you do it, that you use it. Okay, um, so, um, we're going to stop there for today, and um, I'll see you again on Wednesday. Um, don't forget, please, uh, on Wednesday, you'll need to check for your first problem set, uh, which you, and you need, to be, you need to be familiar with accessing through mastering, bio, mastering microbiology on Canvas, okay? And I will see you on Wednesday.
can't find my way out. Come on. <laughs> 